Okay, so we're at module three, and what we're doing this week is we are learning how to get the computer to make a decision that we want it to make. That is everything that this is about, and it is the foundation of how you are going to program. All programming is about branching. Make a decision and do something. Move the joystick to the right. Your character moves to the right. That is input, and that is the decision that was made based on that input. Move the joystick to the left. Character moves to the left. Same thing. Depends on the movement of the joystick. The software makes the decision and then acts on it. And that's what we're going to start the process of this week is how do we how do we get the computer to make a decision? Let's just do a little bit of background. Understanding how to program Python or any programming language to make a decision is the first part of writing an algorithm. What is an algorithm? It is a procedure for solving computational problem. Think the game in week seven. The foundations are al of algorithms are this module, module three. This is the beginning of decision and branching. Four is looping. We take branching and we notch it up by doing it repeatedly. Module five is functions where you can name your algorithms. Module six is data structures. You can really start to see the, um, the power of data-driven code because that's what we're going to do. We're going to take our data structures and we're going to use those data structures to make decisions. Module 7 is data storage, which is great. It's file input and output. And then module 8 is kind of encapsulating everything into objects. So, excuse me, this is what we're doing for the rest of the term. Okay? And it starts this week. We have some new keywords. We have the keyword if, the keyword elif, and the keyword else. Now, unlike the other keywords we've seen, these have a specific order. If you are making a decision, the first decision is all, always starts with if. If there are subsequent decisions associated with that if, like maybe they use the same test variable. Additional ones are L if. So kind of read that as else. Okay, the first one didn't come out true, so let's see if this one comes out true. And the very last one is else. When all else fails, do whatever I tell you to do here. So those are the three keywords we are learning this week for decision and branching. Each one, if and elif make specific decisions. Else doesn't. But they all branch. They all allow you to do something different in your code based on input. We're going to be using relational operators. The relational operators are is equivalent to. Remember the last few weeks I've been saying a variable is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign? I say single equal sign because a double equal sign is equivalent to. It's a comparison um, of two things. Not equal is not equivalent to. We have less than, less than or equal to, greater than or greater than and equal to. Okay. Boolean operator. So we've got new keywords, new relational operators, and now we have Boolean operators. Boolean operators allow you to, to create compound decisions. And there are three Boolean operators. There is and, or, and not. And says all of the statements have to be true for the compound statement to be true. Or is any one statement can be true for the whole compound statement to be true. And not is the opposite. So it would be not and or not or. Frankly, I don't use the not before and and or um, very often. I prefer to write my compound statements using and and using or. And I, I've, I've never really run into a situation 
where I've had to use not and or have to use not or. Um, but we can talk about that. And um, none of the labs you're going to do this week are going to require you to use the not before and or the not before or. Okay. Uh, Jesus, I just had this. Sorry. Sorry, again. My bad. Let me delete this slide. Start over. I redid these slides again, and you guys are the guinea pigs. So... There are two possible outcomes for a decision in Python, and that is true or false. All computer decisions are binary. They're like a light switch, not even a dimmer, because um, computers are stupid. Computers can make two decisions, true or false. It's like it's, you do a light switch on, and then you turn the light off. Those are the two states. That's it. So we as programmers have to learn to write the questions that we're going to ask the computer to think about. Um, we have to break those questions down. We can't ask a question like we would to a human being. We have to kind of dumb the questions down and make them very specific. Um, all decisions come down to true or false. If you remember that, if you are thinking about a decision and you think about it like when you were in high school and you had to take a true-false test where it was a statement and then you had to pick true or false, that's what we're doing here. Okay. We, talked, we touched on this in Module 1, but now we're really going to talk about it because it's becoming very important. We have the concept, excuse me, of scope. Scope dictates when Python will execute a line of code. Everything we've done in week one and week two is in what's called the global scope, which means everything is available to everything. Um, now we're going to do something called the local scope. And this is when you're defining uh, any of the Python inside of a class, a function, a loop, or a branch. And that code is only available inside the branch or the loop or whatever. Um, and if you don't actually evaluate to true in your branch, in your if statement or your else statement, it's as if that code in the local scope of that statement never existed. So, what is a decision in the computer world? A decision is a comparison between two values which results in a true or false. That's it. That is what a decision is. You are always comparing two values. Now, often those values are contained in variables. That's how we get to them. We get to them usually by at least using the, a variable name for one of them because it's data driven. Um, but that's all it is, and that's all you can do. You can only compare two values. That's why compound decisions are so important, because you are limited. This is a very, very limited mindset when you come to making decisions for a computer. So you have to remember that, and it's one of the things that I think is hardest for students and people who are new to programming to understand is that we see these computers as these absolutely amazing boxes, and they are, but simultaneously they can only make one of two, one of two decisions, true or false, that's it. So we have to be able to dumb our questions down to a comparison between two values or to a series of comparisons between two values using Boolean operators and or or. Okay, so here's a quick example. This is a Python script. Number equals 42. Num2 equals 41. This is what the computer sees. All right, num1 and num2. The comparison that is the if statement reads, 
num1 is less than num2, true or false. So we have 42 is less than 18, true or false. In this case, it's true. So that's a decision right there in the computer. I have, uh, I have my keyword if. I have a variable that contains a value. I have a um, relational operator, less than in this case. And then I have another variable that contains a value. So what I'm doing is I am basically asking a true-false question, which is what we did here. So let's talk about formatting and scope. Scope is very important. One of the things that trips students up when they start to program in Python is that they don't understand how indentation and scope work together. Because indent Python is a case-sensitive, space-delimited language. We know about case-sensitive. We've talked about it in Module 1 and Module 2. Module 3, we're now talking about space-delimited. Okay. It is important that you have the right indentation to tell Python that you're in a local scope or a global scope. So let's see what I mean. All of these things in blue are in the global scope. All of the things in orange are in the local scope. For something to be in the local scope, it has to be indented one tab underneath the branch. So here we have if user age less than 18, and then underneath that indented is print 18 or less. That's the local scope. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, then we fall to the else, and we underneath that else, we also, <coughs> excuse me, have a local scope. Oh, sorry. Um, we also have a local scope. So this is how that works, and that's what and that's what scope is. And in a minute, we're going to break, and I will show you in Python how that works and what happens if you don't indent th indent things correctly. Ah, sorry. If else. If tells Python it's about to make a decision. Else tells Python that all decisions have been made and they came out false, so do this. The if statement reads, user age is less than 18, true or false. Where's the rest of it? Ah. You have to remember this thing called a colon. Whoops. Sorry about that. Go back. Okay. There's a thing called a colon here, and I don't know why it flipped over. The colon tells Python that it has to end the statement. Just like we have a question mark, Python has a colon. And without that, Python's going to give you an error message because it doesn't know where it's supposed to end. It doesn't know that you have ended an if statement, and you'll get a syntax error. Um, a couple of rules. A statement is value followed by Boolean operator followed by a variable or a value. It's only the local scope if it's indented. Even if you intend it to be the local scope, if you don't indent it, indent it, Python won't know. Okay, we're just going to talk a little bit more about indentation. Here we just have challenge 322, and it's just in PyCharm. So if I'm looking at PyCharm, when I say left justified, it's where this blue line is. It, it is at the very left. When I say something is indented, the first character of, um, an, of an 
a local scope is going to be touching that orange line. So this is just a visual because you can also have things, you can have if statements inside if statements and indentation. But for this, this is what we're doing. When you're typing it into Zybooks or when you're ty typing it into PyCharm, this is what you're doing. If it's all the way over to that where that blue line would be, even though you don't have the blue line, if it's all the way over to the left, then you are aligned on the left-hand side and it is in the global scope. If you are not aligned, then it is not in the global scope. Therefore, it must be in a local scope. Um, <coughs> for every branch, there's going to be a separate local scope. And local scopes don't know about each other. Okay, The local scope inside the if knows nothing about the local scope inside the else. They are completely separate. They're almost like their own mini little programs. Um, computers aren't smart, neither are programming languages. So if I ask a question, am I younger than 18? Python's going to say, I have no clue. What do you mean are you younger than 18? Because Python doesn't speak English. So we have to speak Python. Um, how do we ask a question? Am I younger than 18? Python's going to do, huh? So how do you ask this question to Python? Well, we know that a decision is the comparison of two values. So if the age that I give it is less than the value 18, then I can probably safely say that I'm younger than 18. So I have a test variable called user age. It's going to be used in the comparison that the if statement is going to do. The test variable must be defined and assigned before you use it in the if statement. If user age doesn't exist, or if it hasn't been assigned properly, then your if statement's not going to work. So I have user age, and now I say if it's at less than or equal to 18, or I read user age is less than or equal to 18, true or false, because there's only two outcomes. So at that point, if it is, then I would print 18 or less. Do this when the outcome is true. That's the only time you do that. Otherwise, I print over 18. So let's take a look at some code for a minute. Let me double check that. Yeah. So this is just, and then we'll take a look at the code. This is just a little flow chart. And we want to follow the flow chart. And one of the reasons I'm doing this is you're going to have to write a flow chart this week. So you're going to need to know how to. So I have a start. I have my user age equals an input. I have this diamond here, which is if user age is less than or equal to 18. So what, what do I do? So I have um, an input, two outputs, and a decision in the middle of the two outputs. So the decision, which is the diamond shape, and by the way, make sure your shapes are correct because I will take off points if these shapes aren't correct. And there is a guide to the shapes in the learning module for, uh, in, yeah, in the learning module for module three. So we're going to have user age, and we're going to check user age against this value 18. True means print 18 or less. False means print over 18. Now I put a little box here that says this is what else looks like. So when you are dealing with a decision in a flowchart, because it's language agnostic, you, you deal with the decision, but you have to also deal with each possible outcome of that decision. And since the outcomes are possibly true or false, you have to be able to understand what false will do. False will do whatever is in the next next in the branch chain. In this case, it's else. So if we just take a quick look, actually, I don't think I'm going to do this. 
Uh, well, it's quick. So 21 is less than or equal to 18 true or false. False, all the true stuff goes away, and I'm going to print over 18. If I do this again, and I say 10 is user age, so 10 is not less than or equal to 18, so it, it, it is false. So everything on the false side goes, sorry, it is true. Everything on the false side goes away, and it prints 18 or less. So let's take a look at this in PyCharm. Whoops. So I have here, let's make this bigger. Let's go full screen. I have here 3.2.2. And what we're going to do is we're going to step through this. And then I'm going to mess it up so we can see what kind of error messages you get. When it's messed up, you know how to fix them. So I'm going to debug this. And I, it's waiting for user age. So I'm going to say my user age is 42. What in the world is wrong? Okay, let's do this again. Two point oh, I'm doing the wrong one. That would be why it's two point two point three point two point two right there. My apologies, had the wrong one set up. So we're gonna debug this. Now I've stopped on user age again. I'm just gonna go over this a little bit. When you see this blue line in PyCharm while you are debugging, and this comes from the debugger, that means you have not yet executed the line, and Python is waiting for you to tell it to execute the line. You tell it to execute the line by stepping over that line. So in this case, it wants a number. So I'm going to put in 42 and hit the Enter key. Now I am on line 6. Line 6 is going to say user age less than or equal to 18. Here I know my user age is 42. So I would say 42 is less than or equal to 18, true or false. That's going to be false. Now watch what the debugger does when I step over. It immediately goes to line 10. These two lines, as far as the Python interpreter, don't exist in that moment in time because there's no it doesn't need to do anything with line 7 and 8 because the uh, if statement evaluated defaults. So I went all the way to 10. It's going to print over 18, and we're done. So now let's walk through it again. This time, I'm going to step over. I'm going to put 12. So user age is 12. Here, it's going to say user age, which is 12. By the way, you can do this. You can simply mouse over a variable at any place in your code, and it will tell you what its current value is. The other way to look at that is to go under the debugger. And then over here under the debugger, it's going to tell you what your variables are. So this is 12, and it's an integer. So what? Python is going to do is it's going to say, well, 12 is less than or equal to 18, and that's a true statement. So when I step over, I'm going to print 18 or less. I'm going to print another line, and then I'm done. I don't make it to line 10 because this was true. So now let me mess this up a bit. Let's start with this one. See all these nice little red lines? That's because the first line under the if statement has to be indented. If I tried to run this right now, I got indentation error, unexpected unex an indentation block, because this guy is left justified, not indented, so he's not in the local scope, and he has to be in the local scope. The only way this line of code will be executed is if it's in the local scope. So to do that, I tab. Now, what if I did this? 
I don't have any wig squigglies up here. Those red squigglies are gone. I don't even have a red squiggly on this line. However, I do on this line, but you're like, hey, wait a minute, this line's just fine. So let's try and run it, and if I run it, I'm going to get syntax error, invalid syntax, and it's going to be on this line. But this line isn't the problem. Line 9 is completely perfect. Line 8 is the problem because it's not indented. So what I have told Python is I've said, if the user age is less than or equal to 18, print 18 or less, and then always print another line. <coughs> print is not in the local scope of the if block. Uh, sorry, it's not in the local scope of the if statement. So the minute line 8 becomes global scope, which it is, it's all left justified, so it is in the global scope. The minute that happens, this is no longer valid code because this else is only going to be associated with an if, and it has to be associated with an if. If everything under the if is properly formatted in a local scope, I can't break out into the global scope between an if and an else. So when I do that, we're all happy again. So now let's see one more thing. If I take off this colon and I try and run it, now this is one of the few places in Python where an error will make sense, where it's going to actually tell you where the error is. Because here, down here, I have syntax error, invalid syntax, and it's pointing to the place that I am missing the colon. Um, so let's keep going. So, one more decision maker. We just talked a bit about if and else. I got my animations wrong. My apologies. How long ago is my year in school? So I have this Python script, and I have a bunch of things that have to be evaluated against the same test variable. Year is my test variable. I'm going to input the year, and then I need to test the year. That year is going to be tested against a whole bunch of things. And so what I do, because they're all related, they're all using the same test variable, I use the LIF decision maker. And what this does is it says if the first decision evaluates to false, then look at the second decision. If the second decision evaluates defaults, then look at the third decision. And if the third decision um, evaluates defaults, then look at the fourth decision and the fifth decision. Um, I, I actually, for a long time ago, used to write um, a programming language. It was a small um, proprietary language for a company. And I had one of these things that was a hundred line, a hundred, a hundred if else statements because it had to deal with all the different possibilities associated with the computer language. Um, and so here is just to show you what if else looks like. I have my start, I have my input year, and here are all of the different ways that it's going to be evaluated. I say year is greater than or equal to 2102. True, we're going to print and go all the way to the end. If this is false, we are then going to go to another decision. Year is greater than or equal to, 20, to 2001. Print, and I'm done. Finally, well, not the, the third decision I'm making is year is greater than or equal to 1901. If it is, then I print 20th century. If not, then I'm over here and I'm in the else. So this is the graphical representation of this. 
Now, I want to go in and spend a little more time on that code, 3.2.4. Come on. 3.2.4. Because I want to show you a little something. Let me edit the configuration. Okay. So, I have these ls statements. And a lot of people think, well, why can't I just have a bunch of if statements? Well, let's run it through this way. And I'm going to turn it all to if statements, and we'll run it through again. So I'm going to start by debugging this, and I'm going to input the year, um, 212102 for right now. So 2102 is greater than 2101. So I'm going to step over. I'm going to print distant future and, oops, and that's fine. And then I'm going to step over. So I printed distant future. I'm going to get rid of this here because this isn't really part of the, but I am going to do this. Yeah. So I printed distant future, and you'll notice I didn't print anything else. In fact, there was nothing else pretty much for it to stop on. That's why I put this print down here. So if I run it again, and I put 2002, hit the Enter key, I'm going to step over line 9, and everybody can guess that that's going to be false because 2002 is not greater than 2101. Now I'm going to step over L if, so else, if the year, the test variable that I'm testing all these against, is greater than 2001, then I'm going to print 21st century, and then I come to the global scope print, and it's done. So we just saw how that worked. It's going to skip and skip and skip until it finds the right one that it evaluates to true, and then it doesn't print anymore because it can only only one of these can evaluate to true. Only one. There can be only one evaluation to true here. Now, if I change this to LF, to if, let's see what would happen. So the only thing I've done is I've made them independent if statements. I have removed the dependency of one if statement against another. So I'm going to debug this again. I'm going to print 2102. So 2102 is greater than 2101. If I go to the console, I'm going to print that distant future. But now what you see is I'm now at line 11. Before, I didn't get to line 11. We just jumped over all of them because it used an elif, and an elif makes whether or not it even gets looked at dependent on the if. So now if I step over this, 2102 is greater than 2001, so I'm going to print 21st century. And 2102 is greater than 1901, so I'm going to print 20th century. The only thing I don't print is this else from long ago. So notice the difference in behavior when you have an LF. So if I go back here and I do LF, now these are all related. If, if this one evaluates to true, then I'll never even hit this one. So let's look at this again. I'm going to debug it. This time I'm going to put in uh, 1902. So 1902 is not greater than or equal to 2101. So I don't even hit that. But now I'm going to go and evaluate line 11. I'm evaluating line 11 because line 9, this if statement, was false. And by the way, that's another nice thing you can do. You can hover over the Boolean operator, and it will tell you, PyCharm will tell you whether it's true or false. So this one is still false. So now I'm going to drop down to the next one 
and this one is now true. So I'm only going to print out 20th century and I'm done. So see how the elif changes the behavior from just if. When it was just if they were separate statements, Python did not care because we told them there's no relationship. When we use elif, there are relationships. And the relationships are everything in a chain. This is a chain. If, elif, elif, and else. They're, they're all in one chain. They're all related. Um, okay, so we looked at that. Now we're going to look at our ands and ors. And this is where some, sometimes people get a little lost with complex decisions. But really what it is, is you just have to break down the individual decisions. Because um, a compound decision is just an easier way to write a lot of different decisions. Um, you combine these individual decisions because a decision is still the comparison of two values. That's still all it is. But now we get to add them up to make complex decisions. So, and this is a truth table. So if you put and in between two decisions, because that's where they're used, you're going to have, you know, one decision, then you're going to have another, and you're going to put the and in the middle. And what you are really doing is you are compa and compares the outcome of the decisions. It doesn't compare the decisions themselves. It doesn't care about the decisions. And and or look at the outcome. And what they do is they basically say, am I going to add it up and how is it going to come out if I add it up? So with and, two trues always makes a true. With and, a true and a false always makes a false. With or, true and true is still true. And by the way, false and false is always false. But here's the difference with, between an or and an and, and it's this last little truth statement. True or false is always going to be true. So it's the opposite of and. If, you, if and is a true and a false, then it's always going to be false. If true or false, it's always going to be true. So that's where you really need to deal, understand when you're going to use an and and when you're going to use an or. When you want to determine the overall outcome of something. And I will often have large complex statements that are anding and then or and then anding and then or. Or I might have a bunch of stuff that's ORed and then ANDed. It all depends. But you can do a lot with this. And understanding how to use these is very important to future programming. Um, it is so much easier, in my mind, to write a, com a good complex statement than to have a bunch of repeated IF and ELIFs. But that's just personal opinion. Okay. Let's take a look a little bit more about the Boolean operator. Um, we have just two variables, 10 and 2. If I'm using an AND and I look at this IF statement, if NUM1 is equivalent to 10 and NUM2 is equivalent to 2. So how does this evaluate? It evaluates based on whether or not the outcome of each decision is true or false. So if num1 is equivalent to 10, so is num1 equivalent to 10? True. Yes, it is. And then we go, don't worry about the and at this point. Then look at the next decision. And we say num2 is equivalent to 2. True or false? Well, that's true. So I have true, and I have another true. So what's the operator that's between them? And. And if one evaluates to true, and the second evaluates to true, and there's an and in the middle, it's always true. The next example <coughs> is if num10 is equivalent, if num1 is equivalent to 10, and num2 is less than 2. 
So let's look at each part, each decision individually, and then figure out what's happening when we add the Boolean operator. Num1 is equivalent to 10, true or false? That's true. Num2 is less than 2, true or false? That's false. So I have a true on for the first decision. I have a false for the second decision. When I put the and in the middle, the truth table tells us that true and false is false. So that statement will be false. So let's look at or. Or is num1 is equivalent to 10, true or false. So my first outcome is true. The second outcome, let's take a look. Num2 is less than 2. Well, that outcome is false, but I have an or in the middle now. So I have true or false, and true or false is always true. So that's how you read the complex statements. You, the Boolean operators deal with the outcomes. They do not deal with the individual, val individual values. So you always have to, when you're reading a complex statement, you have to think about true, true, or true, false, or false, false. That's what you have to think about. And then you have to figure out how the Boolean operator changes the outcome to true or false based on adding all these different outcomes up. So we're going to talk about between now. Between is very important. It's a concept that a lot of students grapple with when they're first beginning to program. And it is because it's their, normally their first foray into using Boolean operators. Because this is, a, this is a classic example of how to use Boolean operators. And I've got a little Python script called between.py, which we will go out and look at. It's not part of Zybooks. I just wrote it up so that we could specifically talk about between. So what we have here is we have a series of related decisions. We know they're related because after the if, there are LIF statements. So all of these are related. And why are they related? Because we're using all the same test variable. Okay, The test variable's age, and every single one of them uses age. And therefore, I'm going to make these all LIF because they are all related. And I only want one answer from this chain of things. I only want to know if what, what age I am when I go to school, or what school I go to at what age. So if I look at these, I have ages between 0 and 3, 2, or false. So let's break that down. Age is less, 20 is less than 0, true, or false. Well, that is Sorry, 20 is greater than 0, true or false. That's true. And then I go over and I say, so I have a true. I say age is less than 4, true or false. That's a false. If I look at the Boolean operator, it's an and, which means true and false is false. So I'm not printing out no school. Then I have age is greater than or equal to 4, and age is less than 9. 20 is greater than or equal to 4. Have a true. Age is less than 9. Have a false. The Boolean operator is and. So L if age greater than or equal to 4 and age less than 9 comes out false. So let's go down to the next one. The next one is age is greater than or equal to 9. So it's 20 greater than or equal to 9. True or false? True, again. Then the second, oper the second um, question is age less than 13, true or false? False. I have an and, true, and false is false. Go to the next one. So this one is age greater than or equal to 13. That's true. The second decision is age less than 19. Well, that's false. True and false. 
is false. So in this case, I go out to infinity and beyond. So let's take a look at this real quick. My next one, complex question. Okay, yeah, we're going to get into that in just a minute. So let's go out whoops, and look at between. Where is between? Here's between. Um, so if we take a look at this, let us, we're just going to do input here. Okay. So get that bigger. I'm going to, okay, maybe not that big. I hope that's okay. I'm going to change this to between, between. So let's take a look at this. So I'm going to run this a couple different ways so we can see how it behaves and how between works. So as always, I like the debugger. So it's going to input an age. So I'm just going to input 10. Now, the nice thing about PyCharm, one of the nice things is not only can I do that, but I can also do that. See how it changed the color? PyCharm will take the entire compound statement and tell you what it evaluates to. Or you can go over the relational operator and it will tell you what the outcome of the decision is. So in this case, the outcome of age greater than zero is true. The outcome of age less than four is false. So the total outcome is false. So I'm going to step over that. Now I'm at the ELIF because remember, we didn't print anything because I didn't make it into the local scope because that was false. Age greater than or equal to four evaluates to true. Age less than nine evaluates to false. True and false is false. So I'm not going to print what's on line eight. I'm going to step over. Age greater than or equal to nine is true. Age less than 13 is true. I have an and, so everything is true. So I'm going to step into line 10. So now I'm on line 10 because true and true is true. And I'm going to print out input oh, middle school. So let's do that. So I was in middle school. So we saw how that acted. You have two separate decisions. You determine the outcome of each decision, and then you determine what the op how the operator is going to handle the outcome of those decisions. Is that clear? I'm hoping it's clear. I, I've spent I spent a lot of time while I was on break the last term trying to figure out how best to describe this. Okay, good. I won't I won't harp on between much more then. Okay, so here's an example of a complex question that might be very similar to a lab. And it's also how to use the floor operator. You're going to have a lab, or you're going to have to deal with coinage, and you have to use the floor operator. And by the way, the labs this week are non-trivial. Okay, they're pretty long. But if you figure out the pattern, it's not that difficult. Patterns are important, and if you figure out the pattern for the solution, it's just a matter of making sure your colons are in the right place and your indents are in the right place. So here we just have um, a number, and I want to find the number of times I have a hundreds and the number of times I have tens. And my num is 223. And here's where I'm going to use the floor operator. The floor operator is the, the slash slash. And what that does is it gives me the whole number. So 
So the whole number of times 100 goes into 223. By the way, modulo doesn't work here. It's got to be the floor operator. So I have 223, and to get the number of times 100 goes into 223, I'm going to say 223, floor, 100, and I'm going to get a value that's going to go into 100s. Now I need to calculate the remainder, and this has to be done as a separate action. I'm now going to say num is num minus hundreds, however many hundreds there are, times 100. And then I have, I'm going to get my number of tens from that remainder. Now, I've got a series of questions I have to ask because I have to know if there is a single hundred or multiple hundreds. So I say if hundreds is, is equivalent to zero, no hundreds. Otherwise, hundreds is greater than one. Um, and then I just print out the number of hundreds. And I do the same thing for 10. So this is just an example of how to use the floor operator to, to determine the whole number of times one number goes into another. And that's very important for one of your labs this week. And I will get to the labs in just a moment. Let me move this back. Okay. So this is just the flowchart. Again, it's just to kind of show you what a complex flowchart looks like when it comes to these because you are going to have to do a flowchart this week. So you'll see that for every if and elif, I have a diamond. When I don't have a diamond for the else, I just have the final false. So... Uh, this week, starting this week, I am not doing flowcharts anymore for the labs. I'm doing pseudocode. You've got to do a lot of pseudocode. Please go out and read the pseudocode guide for um, Module 3. It will tell you what you need to do. And what is pseudocode? Pseudocode is an, a language agnostic way of describing the logic of a program. So we've done it pictorially with flowcharts, and we're going to do it verbally with uh, pseudocode. So for pseudocode, you have things like set. You do have if, else if. You have then. So read up on what that is. But from now on, and these will be up in... Um, for the students in my class, these are in the announcements. So there is an announcement this week of Module 3 pseudocode. For those who aren't in my class, these will be up tomorrow, and I will be putting the slides up as well, so they'll be at the end of the slides. Oh, oh and there's a separate link as well in the description just to the pseudocode. So what is this? Lab 3.11 says, write a program whose inputs are three integers and whose output is the smallest of the three. So this is a min. We're looking for the minimum here. So first, I have to take three input statements. So I'm going to have first, second, and third. I'm going to have input, and I have to make sure on that input that I convert the input to an integer because we've got to... We're dealing with this as a number. Now, this is going to be a compound set of statements. So first, I have my if, and I'm going to see if first is less than or equal to second. I'm also going to check first against third. If first is less than or equal to second, and it's less than or equal to third, then I, I know absolutely that first is the smallest number because that's what that compound statement did. And if not, now I just have to convert to check second. If second is, is less than or equal to first and second is less than or equal to third, then I absolutely know that second is the smallest number. Otherwise, third has to be the smallest number, period, end of statement. So this is compound statements. That's what this is. And this is how you want to write it.
Now, this is a long one, okay? This is a program that talks about the dates and the seasons. And I have seen people try and shorten it, and I do not believe that there is an easier way to shorten it unless you are using potentially a dictionary. But we haven't discussed dictionaries yet, so don't go down that road. This is about if, elif, and else. Now, in here, you also have to realize that we're going to be using if statements inside other if statements, so in the block, because you can do that. So what do I have? Well, I have 12 months, January through December. I have days of the month. So I'm going to go this month-wise. I'm going to say, starting with January, how do I know whether or not the date is valid first? Well, I know the date is valid because it can't be less, it can't be zero or less, and it can't be greater than 31. If I put in 35, I want this program to say it's invalid. So that's the else all the way at the end. And by the way, here's what I would do if I were you, okay? And I was programming this for the first time. Let's just do a new file. It's going to be a new Python file. Call it month. Okay. So to check this logic, here's what I would do. I would just start off with month equal January, day equal 10. And then I would say if month is January, and day is greater than zero, and day is less than or equal to 31, colon, print, hold on, print January, okay? So let's just run by this real quick. I'm just going to run it. Whoops, wrong one. Edit configuration, month, and this is really called incremental programming. What you want to do is take baby steps. You don't want to write this whole thing at once. So if I run month, let's go run month, uh, it says name January is not defined. If month is oh, it has to be a string, Lisa. I got ahead of myself. Okay, so if month is equals the string January and day equals the 10, let's see what happens. So I printed January. Now, let's see what happens. If I say minus 1, well, there's a problem because I have to say, what do I have to say? I have to say invalid. I didn't say invalid, even though it was minus 1. So now I know I need to do this. Okay? So I'm going to run it. It's invalid. So that's good. So now you want to go on to your next month. Leave this structure in place. So now I want to do an L if month is February, I'm not going to type the whole thing, and day greater than zero, and day less than 30. Let's assume it's a, a leap year. Okay? And then I'm going to print February. So if I run it at this point, first of all, I get no syntax errors. Secondly, I still get the same invalid, which is fine because that's what those dates are. So now if I do Feb and day is minus 1, I should still get invalid, which I do. Now if I say day is 31, I'm testing the ed edge condition. It's still invalid. If I say 29, 
I get them. I'm just done January and February. So in next case, let's go see. So I'm just showing you how to do this. I'm only going to do one more, and then you guys get to do the rest. So actually, it's winter, winter, and then March is here, this. So this is actually winter. And you got to make sure that all your stuff is the same. OK, so that doesn't work. But now I'm going to do another elif. Month is equivalent to March. Now, because March is split into two seasons, it's winter and spring, and it's done by day. So I've got the month, now I've got to get the day. So this is where I do another if block inside of it. So I'm going to say if day is greater than zero and day is less than or equal to 19, I'm still in winter. OK. Whoops, I forgot my colon. Greater than. Wait a minute. Is less than or equal. So this has to be indented because this is an inner block. And now I'm going to check the next one. It's related because we're using day here. So I need to be greater than 19 and less than or equal to 31. And this is the pattern. You have to do it this way or it's not going to work. So I'm going to print spring. Whoops. Or I'm going to print in valid. Day greater than and print winter. What's wrong with this one? There it is right there. See all these red squiggles? And it's because I forgot a colon right there. So, and this one's wrong. There we go. So now notice, notice here that we have two print invalids. And that's because it depends on when the invalid gets caught. Here, we have to put the invalid in its own else statement because we are now checking further for dates. So here, I didn't have any splits in January and February between winter and spring. March has the split between winter and spring. So I have to split it. The way I do that is inside a local scope of the month of March check, I have a whole nother set of checks that are based on the day. Now, because they're based on the day, it's if, elif, and else. And this is how you write that. I'm not going to do any more. You guys have to do the rest. But this is how you write this. And that's what I meant by a pattern. There are two patterns. There's a month that doesn't cross a, uh, a seasonal boundary, and there is a month that does. And by the way, I'm not putting up month.py, but it's here for you guys to look at. It's, it's here in the video as an explanation tool. So that's what all of this is about, is finding the patterns. And by the way, the patterns are right here in the pseudocode. So now we're going to do another long lab. Again, this one is about patterns. So you're going to write a program with the total change amount as an integer input and output the change using the fewest coins, one coin type per line. So basically, 
you're going to have dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. And you're going to use singular and plural coin names as appropriate. So dollar as opposed to dollars with an S. Dime as opposed to dimes with an S. This is where the floor operator comes in. Okay? First thing you have to do is make sure that there is change. There is change. So if I put in um, a minus one, there's not going to be any change. If I put in a zero, there's not going to be any change. The only thing that will get me change is a positive number greater than one, greater than zero. Excuse me. So now I need to do my calculations. I need to figure out the number of dollars, and then I need to get the remainder. And then I need to figure out the number of quarters and get the remainder. And dimes get the remainder. Nickels get the remainder. And what's ever left is pennies. So that is all those set statements. Now, that was just the calculation part. Now what I have to do is I have to print them out properly. So for every calculation I've done, dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies, I'm going to have an if statement. And by the way, these are not related. So these are not if and else. These are if statements because I'm looking at the number of dollars, and then I'm looking at the number of quarters, and then I'm looking at the number of dimes. And then I'm looking at the number of nickels. And finally, I'm looking at the number of pennies. They are different. I am using different values for each of these decisions. I'm using a different variable for the decisions. So they are if statements rather than L if. And basically, if the value for num dollars is greater than zero, I'm going to print out dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to print out the, the value. Then I'm going to say if it's greater than zero, if, if it's equivalent to one, it's a dollar. If it's not, then it's dollars. So that's how you do three, and these are the patterns. You have a very specific pattern for the calculation, and you have a very specific pattern for the output with the if and then the inner if-else that determines whether it's a quarter or whether it's quarters. So those are the labs. They are longer this week, but I believe that you guys can handle them well and um, use the floor operator. Don't try and use modulo. It won't work. Does anybody have any questions? Going once. Okay. Okay, I'm glad yours got answered, Bria. Going twice. Okay. Then we will call it. I'm going to um, end the meeting, and this will be up tomorrow. Please email me uh, if you're in my class and you have any questions. Um, and everybody have a good weekend. Good night.